Good evening and welcome to Roots and Branches, um, our seminar for this evening. I'm Amy Johnson and I'm the Executive Director at Roots and Branches and I'm really pleased that you joined us tonight. Um, it should be an exciting presentation, um, but I'm gonna just take care of a few things before I introduce a couple people. Um, Roots and Branches has been around for 30 plus years and uh, our mission really is to beautify our our, um, our community, uh, whether it's through planting, um, adopt-a-plots um, in throughout the community, or um, Arbor Day, planting trees. Um, we also have a plant sale, but we're really um, promoting um, agriculture, plant growth, the beauty uh, of, uh, of the plants in our community, and, um, and sharing that with our neighbors. So uh, appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We brought you this seminar, uh, of course, free of charge, and we're more than happy to do that. Um, again, part of our mission is to educate, um, but if you would like to make a contribution, we always welcome that. Um, but again, um, we are so glad that you joined us tonight. So uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, April 1st, we have another seminar. Josh Steger from the Allen Centennial Gardens in Madison will be our featured guest. And again, that's 7 o'clock here um, virtually at this point. And um, again, go to our website, uh, rootsbranches.org and you can register and get the link to join us. Um, one of the things that we do every year is we do a clean up green up. It's a fun day. This is gonna be Saturday, May 1st, and we're gonna meet at nine o'clock at the Centennial Shelter uh, in Regner Park in West Bend. And we'll give you supplies, we'll give you uh, a location where you and family members or friends can go and just pick up trash and make, again, our community look beautiful. Um, we also have a plant sale on May 14th and 15th. Um, which is coming up and again all of these events please look at our website for additional information so I want to introduce you to Susan Steinhoffel she is a board member at Roots and Branches and she's also our program chair and she's done a phenomenal job um, working on getting some really nice um, seminars and speakers to um, to work with us and um, educate the community. So Susan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, hi, welcome everyone. If you would like a new hobby to keep spring fever going all year round, then this is for you. And for those who are familiar with Bonsai, Ron will continue to inspire you. Ron Foreman, is the owner of Ancient Arts Bonsai, which is a retailer of bonsai and all supplies needed for this hobby. He has been raising bonsai for 27 years and a lifetime member of the Milwaukee Bonsai Society and Badger Bonsai, bonsai Society. Ron has been teaching beginning bonsai hobbyists for 10 years. He has about 70 trees in his personal collection and six have won best in show at the Wisconsin State Fair over the years. Ron's seminar tonight is Bonsai, a Growing Hobby. What an amazing art form and meditative hobby. Some people may be familiar with this and Ron can explain the intricate details and the difference between the Japanese and Chinese bonsai. So if there's any exhibitions that are coming up, um, Ron can mention that too. Um, during COVID, things might have changed a little bit, but uh, they do exhibit. They do have exhibitions of bonsai, which is amazing. I went to the one in Chicago one year, and it was it was just mesmerizing. It was just amazing. So I'm sure you'll be fascinated by this intriguing hobby that has been around for centuries. It's a meditative art form of transforming trees into amazing art forms. Welcome to our Roots and Branches seminar for March 2021, Ron Foreman 
Bonsai, a growing hobby, myths explained, and secrets revealed. Thank you, Ron. Take it away. All right. Good evening, everyone. So we're going to go through a little bit of basics and just sort of hit on some of the topics, hopefully explain some of the myths that some people have about bonsai and, you know, we'll reveal the secrets. To tell you the truth, there's not a lot of them. So we'll let's move forward. And so again, that's sort of what they've told you. This is, this is me at, at my place. I've been doing bonsai now for 27 years. I have a business that supplies trees and all the, all the things you could possibly need. I've got about 70 trees in my personal collection and I study continuously with different artists. I've worked with one teacher now for about 20 years. I worked with another teacher that I'm working with right now for the past 10. And next month I'm gonna start with a new teacher because uh, this is just a hobby, you'll, you'll never learn enough. You can always, as with anything, you can always continue to improve. So we'll just start out with a very simple thing. It's the correct pronunciation is bonsai. And the literal translation is a tree and a tray or a tree and a pot. This tree that you're seeing right here, this is a forest grouping of a, of a type of juniper. This is probably the most recognizable American bonsai that there's are out there. This was uh, made by a gentleman named John Naka, who's since deceased, but he's basically known as the uh, forefather of American, bone, <clears throat> of American bonsai. And this tree is in the uh, National Museum in Washington, D.C. So you can go and see it. It'll look a little different than this one right here because uh, this is an earlier picture. He initially did this arrangement and there was a tree for every one of his grandchildren. Well, of course, as time progressed, there became more grandchildren. So he added some more trees to it in a later planting. But it is still alive and in the National uh, Bonsai Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, the picture that of uh, the tree that was on the flyer for this presentation is a tree that is has an unbelievable history. <clears throat> this is called the Yamaki pine. Uh, this tree was in Hiroshima when we dropped the bomb on that city. It uh, had already been in the family for several generations at that point. And uh, it got knocked off its bench. It didn't, didn't incur any severe damage. The uh, family you know, continued to uh, work this tree over the years. And in 1976, the Jap at, our, at the US Bicentennial, Japan gave the United States a number of trees as a gift. And this happened to be one of them. And even at that time, nobody knew that this tree was in Hiroshima at that time. This tree was actually collected in the, uh, I believe it was the late 1600s by many generations back of this family and had been passed through. So this tree has got quite a, quite a history and so is just amazing that, and again, another tree you can go see at the National Bonsai Museum. So if you're in Washington, D.C., this is a, and you, and you like nature and stuff, this is a place to go. And it's free. So let's just ask a few questions that people think about them. You know, is bonsai a specific species? No. There is no bonsai tree. It is, we use any number of different trees and Bonsai is really more of an art form. Are bonsai kept indoors? Generally speaking, all of my trees are outside. 
The only difference would be is uh, my tropical trees at this time of year, of course, wouldn't be very happy outside. So they're kept in a greenhouse down in the basement during the winter. But typically speaking, I have no trees inside my house in general. They're outside, they're trees, they, they enjoy the sun, they enjoy the humidity and all those things. And so the only difference is they're in pots versus in the ground. And then the other question is, is this hobby based on art or horticulture? And I happened to be able to take a class of Mr. Naka before he passed. And one comment he made in that class that really stuck with me, and this was early in my bonsai journey, he said, bonsai is like an ox cart. And then he just stopped until, of course, somebody raised their hand and says, what do you mean? So you have an ox cart there in the picture, and he says, well, Think of one wheel as horticulture and the other wheel as art. If they're not even, he says, the cart will not pull straight. So bonsai is a hobby that requires a horticultural uh, component and an art component. You can have a really healthy tree, but if you don't style and, and, and make it look right, it doesn't, doesn't do anything. Or if you're really good and can do all kinds of styling, but you can't keep it alive, once again, you have a failure. So it's, it's just something that made sense, and it's always something I try to pass on, especially new students, to understand that there's two components to what you're doing here. And then his third comment was, the axle between the two wheels is the whole Zen philosophy of being in touch with nature. So... What is bonsai? Some say it's living sculpture. But unlike sculpture, is it ever finished? You know, if your tree is constantly growing, it's constantly changing. You know, a sculptor finishes their work and then it goes on display and it never changes. Or, or changes very little as it erodes over time. Some say it's just another form of gardening like specializing in roses or dahlias or tomatoes. But if you're truly doing bonsai with multiple species, while they're all trees, unlike tomatoes or roses, you know, they all are the same cultivar, therefore they do many of the same things. Trees don't, you know, you're working with a pine tree, it's very different than working with a crab apple and so on and so forth. And then there are those out there that say bones are stunted and tortured and very hard to keep alive. Well, not so fast with those generalities. They are very nurtured and, and, and pampered, and live a pretty good life. Uh, it's not unrealistic in general that a, a well cared for bones by over for generations could outlive a tree in nature. So I go back to my first bonsai there on the, as you look at it, it would be the left-hand side. That was in 1994. It's a willow leaf ficus. As it transformed over the years, you see it on the right-hand side. And now this is a picture of it. Uh, I believe this was uh, about two years ago. The interesting thing is, is that it came to me one day, I was looking at, at pictures of the tree as it grows over the years. It's much like taking a look at your kids' pictures from first grade to sixth grade, uh, graduating high school. There's certain features on a human that continue to be there no matter what the age is. Same thing happens with a tree. As it grows older, you, you see, oh, back up here. You see down in here, a couple of years later, this is just getting bigger as that tree increases its girth. And so the characteristic of the tree is gonna stay there throughout its life and certain features will always be something you can fall back on. 
So, how do we start most bonsai? Well, the ultimate bonsai is grown from a seed. Because uh, one of the first questions most people will ask when you have bonsai is, well, how old is it? Well, unless you happen to be the person that sowed the seed, you're probably going to be taking a guess or taking, uh, you know, an estimate from what somebody told you. Hey, yeah, I've been growing that tree for five years and so on and so forth. So that's the ultimate bonsai is you know exactly when it started. Therefore, you know exactly how old it is. They generally can be made from cuttings or we do an air layer, which uh, we literally uh, carve a groove around the tree and cause it to re-root in a different place and then cut a portion of that tree out and actually create a new tree and get rid of sections that maybe had some bad flaws in them. Bones that are grown from nursery stock, we might urban collect and by that, uh, how many houses have you gone by where the shrubs that were planted there so many years ago were just the right size but now are overgrowing the house often and bonsai people will come in and harvest those things from you and and will turn them into bonsai. They can be collected from the wild. And then there are starting to be a number of uh, growers out there that actually grow trees specifically to become moved into the bonsai business. So pre-trained start, you know, not letting them do certain things that you would have to fix otherwise. So there's many ways we can get a tree to start. As far as what's the plant material? Well, virtually any plant material, if it has tree-like features, in other words, if it gets a woody bark, it has multiple branches, if its leaves are proportional to the rest of the tree, could be a good candidate. Our most common varieties we use are pines and junipers, maples and elms, use and large and spruce and if we go to tropical we use a lot of different figs or ficuses shuffalara jade sarissa any number of different trees that could be used so when you're going out and you're looking for a bonsai potential bonsai what do we look for well the number one thing we look for is the trunk it's the foundation of the composition. So in other words, if we find something that's got a very interesting trunk, that's something we're probably interested in. What it's got for branches and what the leaves look like. If the tree is healthy, we're really not that concerned because we can regrow all of that. Branching is important, but it can be created if it doesn't come naturally. I have about three or four trees in my collection that literally look like a post in a pot for their first year until they regrew branches. And then and the last thing, number four, there is foliage. When we're looking at a nursery or something, yeah, foliage is important, but often we're going to be cutting that back and, and replacing it anyhow. What we're interested in is that the foliage is healthy. And we know the tree is healthy. So here's an example. Back in 1999, I actually paid somebody for this. Uh, this is a little leaf linden. I bought it at an auction of a person that was growing it in a bed and I brought it home and actually just threw it into my garden and let it grow there for about another three years. So as you can see, it's, uh, as I would say, but ugly. But once we got it into a pot, you can see here this branch right here. Is actually that branch right there. All the rest of these were removed. And now we've grown all newer branches, finer branches. And really one of the secrets here is in bonsai is the material that we use to grow them in. We try to get very fine roots. So you're looking at the bottom of the root base of this tree. That's very fine cottony roots. So they can take up lots of water 
and that really helps you know feed that tree so as this tree develops so here this tree is 13 years later from the ugly duckling that you saw in the garden now it's starting to have a little shape and form this was at state fair in 2013 then in 2017, so again, you can see in four years, actually, yeah, about four years. So we're here, four years later, you can see how many more twigs and branches we have. And then this was later that year. So again, what you're seeing is this tree is starting to fill out and have that true tree form. And just to get an idea of the size this pot is 24 inches across. The diameter of this trunk is about nine or 10 inches. This is a big tree. It's probably about uh, 39, 40 inches tall. And uh, it's heavy. I, I've, I've scaled this thing out when it's dry. It's a, with the pot in the tree, it's 120 pounds. So, so we don't take it out for walks very often. Uh, as I said, we use a little different soil. Basically, most of our bonsai hobbyists that are you know, into it quite a bit, we have very little or no dirt in our bonsai soil. No garden soil per se, no potting soil. There are exceptions to that rule. But mainly we use a lot of aggregate. And we do that because we are trying to instill and air and water exchange through the roots. And the more air and oxygen exchange we can get, the better that tree will grow, the stronger it'll grow. So some of the things we'll use is a, a crushed sharp granite, fire clay particles, a pumice, a lava rock of a certain size. And there are still some, and there are some cases where we'll use some organic matter. So as an example, I make up a, a bonsai soil that I have used for 20 some years. We start out with 50 pound bags of uh, chicken grit. The stuff over here is the fired, grit, fired uh, turfus particles, which is fired clay. It's all sifted through a screen right there that anything smaller than a eighth of an inch falls through and doesn't get used. And so we sift all of that out get the granules, mix it all together, and pot it up. And I generally make this like a ton at a time. So that's about a two-day process for me. But it's this granules that gives us these, allows these roots to grow this fine. What happens with roots, if we just have them in potting soil or dirt, there's not as much air and oxygen exchange. Therefore, the roots can be lazy. They don't have to work to find water so they just lay there and they don't really have to go out and seek things and it's when the roots are drier and there's more air in it they are going and reaching they become finer and finer roots which then helps us create smaller and smaller leaves so we get the reduction in leaf size that helps keep that leaf proportional to the size of the tree as an example of the tree i showed the little leaf linden those of you that may have one in your yard, that can have a leaf as big as a man's hand or bigger. And that tree there, my biggest leaves are maybe about three to three and a half inches. And that's, you know, just reduced on its own being in this soil type. So the, one of the biggest problems with bonsai is what we call watering. And I would say that 80 to 90% of bonsai that fail Watering is at the at the base or is the main culprit involved there, and quite often it is overwatering that is really the one that kills more trees. As as we joke in, in the bonsai hobby, you're you're either a water wizard or a desert queen, you know. So you're either going to let your plants dry out completely to where they die because you, you know you forgot to water them or you keeping them too wet and therefore they just never tend to 
grow and you'll know, end up getting root rot issues and so on and so forth. But that is the, the one trick and it is uh, something that as I work with uh, new people, novices as we call them, it's one of the things I really drill into you and, and tell you that, you know, if you're really going to get into this hobby, this is something you got to stay on top of because a tree can't tell you that it needs water if you're not smart enough to go out and look. Um, so you have to learn that, you know, what is it? And everyone wants the magic answer, you know, we'll water it every three days. Well, I can't tell you that because it's like saying, how often do you need a drink of water? Does it depend on the temperature that day? Does it depend on what you're doing? Same thing happens with our trees. As they're sitting on the bench and it's a nice sunny day, they're using water at a certain level. If it's windy like today was, well, those trees are transpiring more water, therefore they're going to use more water. A lot of people don't think about that. When it gets humid, you think, well, it's hot and it's humid. You'd be surprised a tree doesn't actually use as much water in a humid because there's nowhere for that water to transpire to because the air is so thick with water, it can't move it. So it's one of these things you have to learn that you, you have to change with what the weather is happening and that's why watering is a, is a big issue. Then it comes to feeding bones up. Well, first off, trees make their own food. Unlike anything else, you know, pets or kids, you know, they, they need to be fed. A tree makes its own food. So in theory, we don't have to feed them. But when we raise them in these small containers, once we get a tree healthy and it's doing well, we supplement that feeding and we offer them more nutrients that they can be stronger and we can do more things with them. And so while that soil offers that tree nothing because it's basically rocks of different varieties, we have to supplement that feeding. Uh, some people will use liquids and that's, you know, that's fine. If we can go organic, it's better. But as with all things, even the organics have issues because again, if it's outside, uh, organics draw the, you know, the chipmunks and birds and everything else want to see what that uh, organic is that's in that soil and think they might want to be interested in it. We got dogs, we put uh, what we call fertilizer cakes on there. Dogs tend to eat them left and right. So again, it's all things, everything's got its drawback. But as you work with uh, bonsai, it is an important step that you got to go through. And the other thing is here in Wisconsin, because we have such a short growing season, it's another benefit if we can be fertilizing our trees at the right time so we can get them to do the things they want and so we can get a good uh, year of growth out of them. So on the, on the left, again, is the little leaf linden some years back. And all those little brown dots you see in there, those are fertilizer cakes. So they're in the soil and basically they're made from rapeseed. Uh, they're an organic thing. There might be a little uh, composted chicken manure in there or something. But basically every time you water, that water percolates through that rapeseed cake and starts to break down. And then the flora in the pot, the microorganisms that are growing in the pot will also feed off of that. And it just builds a healthier tree. Then we come to disease and pest control. I don't find that to be a big issue because if you keep your bonsai trees clean, keep a lot of the litter out of them, keep the weeds down, the tree is healthy, you don't run into too much pest and disease. But then again, there are some things we can't control because our trees are outside and they're in the neighborhood there's a lot of crab apples and junipers out there. So cedar apple rust is something that's just in the air and you can't avoid it. So if you have those types of trees, your bonsai trees are susceptible to catching that also. So you have to watch that. But the other thing is at certain times of the year, we have different pests. 
And I said, you know, bonsai is a hobby, just, you know, you're going to lose some trees, 85, 90% of them is because of watering issues. Cleanliness is going to help it. We can use some preventative uh, things. We can use some fungicides. We can use some insecticides on them. But again, I try not to do that. We, you know, we try to keep it as natural as we can. Uh, but I will make this statement. I do have others that uh, are in the hobby that uh, won't cross the bridge. I have an investment in trees, so I have to use a nuclear weapon, I will. If that's what it's going to take to rid some pests from my trees. Um, again, just this cycle of nature, you know, you get spider mites is another pest that's common to any kinds of the trees. And the first thing novice people think is, well, I've got these spider mites and they want to spray it with insecticide. Well, insecticide does nothing to a mite. It is a mite. It needs to have a miticide. Being a mite, it's like an arachnid. It, it's insecticides don't affect it. So you have to make sure that you're treating with the right thing to, to bite that pest down. And then weeds, you know, weeds are gonna grow inside in your pot with your trees. And there are certain weeds that look somewhat nice, but as I, not, not to be sexist, but generally the ladies, oh, it looks so cute. And it's like, no, it's stealing food from your tree. You gotta eradicate them. You need to pull them. So it's just like a garden, you know, a weedy garden does never looks good. And the same thing would be with a bonsai pot. So here's an example of bad farmers. You got the ants here. Ants will literally farm, these are aphids. So the aphids are a sucking insect that a big insect and they're feeding off the tree and their excrement is what they'll nicely call honeydew. Well, the ants love that. And so the ants will protect the aphids from our other predators so that they can collect the honeydew. So one of the things as a bonsai person, anytime you see an ex, you know, a, a high number of ants on your trees, you should be looking because there's probably aphids or scale or thorps or some other kind of pest that you want to get rid of because the ants otherwise really have no reason to be on your tree. They're only there because there's a food source for them. And then we have these guys, you know, the cute little bunnies, the mice and the chipmunks, and, you know, the squirrels and the robins and deer. Squirrels and the chipmunks, and they're gonna dig in your pot. The birds will sometimes dig if you got moss growing in the pot. They're just looking for bugs, but in the meantime, they're doing things. If the tree is small enough, a big bird comes and sits on a delicate branch ears and breaks it off. The deer, of course, will chew. Rabbits will chew. Mice will chew. But there's exceptions to every rule. So this happens to be uh, my ponderosa pine, which is the oldest tree I have. It's estimated to be between 225 and 250 years old. That's a pair of morning dove eggs. Basically, morning doves are a ground uh, laying breed, a ground nest. Well, she had a couple pine needles there and she basically scooted her butt down and made a little depression in the soil and laid a couple eggs. So I researched up and it says, well, it takes 14 days to hatch, which it did right to the day. On the left, you see the two little guys that, that hatched. In the meantime, uh, both the male and the female morning dove will feed the, the chicks. The interesting thing is not one peep is made from them. Unlike when you see a robin's nest or something else you know the birds are just constantly making noise they don't make a sound why because they're ground nesters they would basically expose where they're at to their predators so therefore they're quiet they don't say anything and then we have our little tree frogs now here in wisconsin you know there are a lot of tree frogs but generally we don't see them but, but i'll tell you what when you got bonsai around they generally will, will 
come around and they will be around in the area. Again, why are they there? One thing you might not catch in this photo right here, this is a slug that's sitting on the top of this frog's head. It happened to come in the greenhouse one evening and it was dark out, I turned on the light. This slug was actually in his mouth at that point and the frog just froze with his mouth open like, you know, you don't see me, you don't see me. In the meantime, the slug crawled up on top of his head to escape. So I just thought it was a comical picture. It's a neat little story to tell. A little guy sitting here on the chair. I was working on a tree and he jumped out of the tree and sat in the chair and worked with me. So, bones that have all the same requirements as any pet or kid, you gotta protect them from the bad things, the deer, the rabbits, the mice, the squirrels. You gotta water and feed them. You, know, you gotta make sure they don't, they don't get pests, or get diseases. Feed them, prune them, you know, cut their hairs, cut their nails, cut their toenails. It's the same thing, bones that all have needs, and a lot of people think, oh, you're fussing on the trees all the time. Not really. You're going to do maybe two or three times a year, you'll do certain things with different trees. Then the rest of the time, you're watering and watching them grow. So one of the big things that I did for my hobby is I put up a greenhouse. It's 16 by 10. And what this greenhouse is really for is for the winter. So I could take all my trees and I put them in here during the winter. I actually, you'll see in further pictures, uh, insulate it. And basically I don't let the trees go below freezing. So they're dormant as they would be in nature, but they're not, don't have the wind on them. They're not getting the elements on them. The other thing it lets me do is I gain about two months in the spring and two months in the fall. So I gain about four months of growing season that I wouldn't if I didn't have the greenhouse which is huge in bonsai. So here it is in the winter. Place full of snow. This is inside the winter and as I said, this is styrofoam, uh, inch thick styrofoam that I put up the sides and over the top. And that helps and the sides are, the lower sides are insulated. What you see along the sides here, these are buckets of water, rainwater that I've collected. So I can water during the winter. And then I have a little heater on here. And again, the heater is just there to keep it from going below. I do, generally don't want to go below freezing. Unfortunately, this year, in the one of the weeks where we were in the below zeros, the heater I had finally gave out. And so this is its new replacement. It's smaller and just and more efficient. So it's working quite well. Also in the winter, I said I keep my tropicals inside. This is a hoop house I have in my basement. This is seven feet high and uh, 15 feet long. As you can see by the, we got lights, fluorescent lights and grow lights in there. And so this is where I keep the tropicals. And inside this house, it's uh, 76 degrees and humid. I run a, a cold water humidifier and a fan. So when the lights go on, the humidifier and fan are running. And I, like I say, it stays about in the mid 70s to near 80 degrees in there. Even though the basement isn't heated, it's just the heat from the lights and the trees all think they're in Florida and they're happy. And light wise, is a combination of fluorescence and grow lights and they're on about eight to 10 hours a day. So actually my winter greenhouse in the basement probably cost me more to run than the one outside, which is also electric heat. Here's the greenhouse in the spring, again, we got water buckets inside. We try to use rainwater exclusively if we can. And then we have benches outside where the trees will go. Um, what you'll note up on top here, this is a shade cloth that prevents, uh, blocks about 30% of the sunlight. So 
that's where I'll put the trees that maybe don't like to be in the sun as much, some of the maples and that. As it gets to midday, later afternoon, they don't like that harsh sun. So if we can block some of the sun, that just makes their life a little nicer. More of the outdoor area. So then other things that are bonsai related, of course, there are specialized tools. We use wire to, to shape and form the branches. We use aluminum or copper, depending on different trees. Um, as with anything, there are a number of magazines out there that are available and books. I probably have a library of, I'm nearing, I think, 150 books on bonsai right now. And then belonging to the bonsai organizations. As far as tools, so these are our main, what we call branch cutters. You're, you're not going to find these anywhere <laughs> other than through somebody that's you know really interested in bonsai they're a highly specialized tool but they are um, very well geared for what they're doing and that's cutting branches off getting good clean cuts uh, you could not use or could you won't have good results just using a, a typical uh, loppers that you would use for your garden it's just more specialized these guys are what we call knob cutters. Again, that's for taking out wood in uh, little deeper areas. Again, these are just different sizes. This is this is the biggest one. That's the smallest one. This one is just through little tiny branches. And we got shears, any number of different size shears. Uh, these are saws that we use when we do repotting for getting the tree out of the pots. Again, more specialized cutters. This is a root cutters. This is wire pliers. And then we have saws and grafting knives, tweezers and other tools for removing stuff, things for sharpening our tools. So you can get all into all of that. that but now about, I was talking about organizations. I'm a lifetime member of the Milwaukee Bonsai Society. I joined back in 1994 and I've been uh, president a couple times. I've been, uh, we've run a couple different conventions that I've been uh, the chairman of. And through that, I was awarded a lifetime membership uh, about uh, six years ago. So I'm now a member of that club for life. Uh, we meet at, uh, when we meet live, which we haven't now in a year, we meet at Borner Botanical Gardens, which is in Hales Corners. It's the first Tuesday of the month that we meet there. Generally, it starts at 6.30. There's usually uh, two or three vendors there, like myself and a couple others, which will have tools and pots and soil and trees and wire and you name it. And the meetings themselves, uh, the Milwaukee Club is averages between about 125, 150 members. And it's not unusual for us to have uh, 60 to 100 people at a meeting. So it's a quite active club. In fact, it's a, one of the most active clubs here in the Midwest. Um, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, you know, that's the only thing that slowed us down here in the past year or we couldn't be together more, but many, many opportunities to do workshops and to gain more skill and abilities, and learn techniques. So it's a good thing to do. Um, you can find them on uh, milwaukeebonsai.org. If you want to look it up on the internet, and that's where you can see our site and you can find out what's going on. And we'll hopefully when we start going back to meetings again and certainly welcome to come nobody will nobody will jump you at the door and twist you to make you be a member we're happy to have people come for guests a couple times to see if they're you know interested or not and generally we don't have to talk at india we just have to be willing to take your money when you want to join uh, milwaukee also has a permanent bonsai collection and it's on the grounds of the linden sculpture gardens which is in river hills which is on the north side of Milwaukee on Brown Deer Road. And it's uh, that 
we're open when the, the gardens are open on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. We have attendance in the bonsai garden. So it doesn't cost anything to go into the bonsai garden, but it does cost to come into Linden. And I'll be honest, off the top of my head, I'm thinking their, their fee for somebody to come in on a day is uh, somewhere around 6 to $10, I think. But we have about 30 to 40 trees on display there, and there'll generally be at least one attendant there, and so you're willing to walk through and look at the trees and ask all, all kinds of questions. And generally, if uh, who's ever happens to be tree sitting that day, they often are brought a tree of their own along to help them pass the time and or they're working on some of the trees that are on display there. That's something to check out. And then I also belong to the Madison uh, Badger Bones Eye Society, which meets on the second Thursday of the month. And we meet at Ulbrick Botanic Gardens, which is on Atwood Avenue. And uh, next month, so the second Thursday of April, off the top of my head, I just take a look here, be the 8th of April. We are actually going to be going live at the gardens with our meeting. And so we'll be at 6.30, and uh, there will be two of us doing a repotting demonstration. And then we typically have an annual show, and this year, uh, as of right now, unless you know things go south again with the whole COVID, uh, May 15th and 16th, we're planning to have the show at uh, Oberk Gardens, and hours of that are typically 10 to 5.00. And we generally have uh, demos each day, generally one at like 11 and, and then another one at one each day. So again, that's that's free. You come to Oldbrook Gardens, you can uh, park at the lot, come in, see the bonsai show. And if you don't go to any other part of the garden, there's no charge to you. So again, in May, if you wanna look at the venture out of the house, They've already told us that you know they're going to hold us uh, 50 people in the room. It's a pretty big room, and that's going to be real simple. You know, we'll just do a head count, and when it's 50, we stop people going in until more people leave. And so, and typically we have again, I'd say somewhere between 30 and 50 trees on display of our members from Madison. Myself, it hurt a little bit. You know, I've been in the hobby 27 years. I started my own little business in 2005. My main sales are when I go to the different club meetings. There's also a club in Fox Valley and one in Green Bay. And I carry all things bonsai. As I always joke to the people, I says, I'm your drug dealer, I have what you want. A um, little information on me, I do have a website, aabonsai.com. <clears throat> And uh, you can see some pictures there, I'm starting to put up things that I do have for sale. It's not so much a site that you can buy from, but you can see what I have and then you can contact me and we can figure out how we can do it. So now some of my trees. So these two, this is the uh, same tree. This is uh, what we call a root over rock stock. So this has grown over this rock for a number of years. This happens to be right now here in the, I just took this picture about a week or two ago, so there's no foliage on it. It is a maple, a trident maple, so it's a maple that has three lobes on its leaves. And I've had this tree now about uh, 12 years. And just to get an idea of size, that pot is about six inches across and that stone probably stands up maybe about 10 inches. And there is a picture of it in leaf. This is another uh, trident maple, again, growing over a rock. As you can see, you know, it's well clasped onto this rock, so again, it, it's to be somewhat, and that's that tree in leaf. 
this is a little uh, impromptu show that we had last year at a site. So typically when we show bonsai, they will be on a stand or this happens to be a slab. And then this is a little accent plant. These are little hens and chicks. And then again, it's just sort of to, as your eye looks at this tree, of course your eye generally goes to wherever the trunk meets the tree. Your eye, oh, back up. Your eye then goes up into the tree, sees the tree, follows down, and then your eye comes and sails here. So that's, you know, you don't realize it, but in reality, I've set that up to help direct your eye it's where it should be looking. So this is a, a Japanese larch, uh, common, what we have a lot of here in Wisconsin, our American larch. So these are the trees that generally grow in the swamps and bogs and they lose all their, their they're a very unique tree. They're conifer, so that means they grow cones to reproduce. But the difference of these conifers is they drop all their needles. So they're sort of this, what we call a deciduous conifer. So these needles all turn yellow late in fall, all the needles fall off. Um, so that was at State Fair. Here it is five years later and you can just see in five years how much that tree starts to fill out, look different. This is another one, this is a Chinese quince uh, this one best to show in 2018. And the unique feature of this tree is it gets this exfoliating bark. In other words, that bark, chunks of it will peel off and then underneath it's actually almost a lime green for a while and then as it gets grayer and darker as it ages. Uh, this tree also will grow the quince fruit that uh, be very quick. Typically, quince fruit is looks like a golden, delicious apple in a way. It's very, very tart. People generally, it gets made into jam if, if people have quince fruit. And while I've had it, I've never had any fruit on there because generally we're pruning and everything, and so we're taking flowers off before fruit ever get to materialize. That is uh, my ponderosa pine that I showed where the uh, morning doves had uh, laid eggs. As I said, this tree is estimated to be somewhere between 225 to 250 years old. It was collected out in the Badlands by a gentleman that actually works for the Forest Service. And the reason we have an estimation on age is they go through the, when they're cutting fire lanes and stuff like that, they will do bore samples of trees in the area and typically trees will be of a similar age so they have an idea because typically what happens with trees is you know, they'll get a uh, fire will go through and destroy them all or a pine borer will come through and kill a whole bunch of them and so if fire goes through and then they repopulate well all the trees are pretty much similar age and so that's how he can give us a an, an estimate of how old that tree is. Interesting thing is the tree, as you see it right there, when I got it, there was almost no foliage where you see actually the foliage was on branches that were about two feet longer than you see now. So what we've done over the years is get the tree to bud back on that older wood, and then we keep shortening the branches to bring the foliage back into the trunk. So that's one of our techniques of, you know, getting that tree to look so, like something special. This is a Korean hornbeam. Again, this is an older tree. This is about, a, about an 80 year old tree. Uh, Korean hornbeams are deciduous, uh, very tolerant of our climate, as you know, North South Korea is this climate quite similar to Wisconsin, gets pretty hard, cold winters. That's a lilac, very petite lilac. And it is, in that particular picture there, it was pretty full of flowers. Interesting thing about flowers and fruit on bonsai, they don't reduce. 
you know, they'll reduce somewhat, but they don't reduce like we can reduce leaves. Flower and fruit always seems to be the size it's going to be. Don't nobody really knows why that is, but uh, it's it's something that's pretty consistent. This is a cork bark black pine, and you know we were hopefully going to do this live last year, hopefully live this year, but you know that didn't work out. But the unique thing about this is this gets a really thick platy bark. That bark is almost maybe an inch to two inches thick on that tree. So again, it's a it's a different cultivar. It's a it's actually a genetic a mutation of an actual black pine, but it causes it to get this really thick contorted bark. And here's an old Chinese proverb: the twisted tree lives all of its life. The straight tree ends up a board. So that's it for my presentation. I'm open for any questions. I'll just sort of unshare this part so we can get back to. All right. So I don't know if anybody's used the chat feature to put up any questions. Oh, Amy, are you monitoring that? I. So I'm on. Um, so one of the questions was, can you use a questions woody? Was, can you use a woody, a woody herb for bonsai? Um, I'm trying to get out of here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to do that. It's not working. Are people will grow uh, rosemary? So I, I've seen a number of rosemary being used. We're getting rid of it. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. We're good, I think. All right. Yes, yeah, so, like I said, rosemary, a lot of people will use rosemary. That makes them beautiful bonsai okay um, and in fact uh, we just passed that time period but I know generally at Christmas time a lot of times you'll see uh, Christmas trees that are rose they've taken rosemary and shaped them into a Christmas tree quite often they have a pretty nice trunk inside those and those can become some pretty nice bonsai okay um, the other question was um, uh, can we get a copy of your presentation? Sure. Okay. All right. All right, now he still can't.
could you use I can't hear anything but racket what is the answer could you, about the woody herb the rosemary could you answer that a quest that question again uh, yes uh, I, I've known a number of people have done it I've not done it myself but I've seen a number of uh, rosemary being used as becoming bonsai again because as you let that grow it will get a very woody uh, bark on its trunk. Another very interesting bonsai tree that I saw at the show down in Chicago a number of years ago was somebody that took a coleus. What do we all think of that? That's a perennial that we all buy. Mm -hmm. at the end of the year, you throw them away. Well, this person took it and kept it in a greenhouse. And after a couple of years, it actually got a woody bark to it. And there's nothing as stunning as this tree with those multicolored leaves on it. It was just spectacular. Only sad thing for the individual that had entered that in Chicago is that year there was a gentleman from Japan that was a judge. And because that was non traditional material, you know, he just walked by it like it wasn't even there. Oh. <laughs> and it was like it was the hit of all it was the hit of everyone else that saw that. Everyone stopped and says is that polius? Wow. And uh, another thing that you can do, another one that you can do, a lot of people don't think is, is our mumps. In fact, there's a uh, King's mums. I believe they're in Oklahoma now. Used to be in Ohio, but they will, they have starters of different uh, varieties of chrysanthemums that can be made into bonsai. Wow. And again, anytime you have a flowering bonsai, it's, uh, it's, you can never go wrong. Uh, as I always say, when we have our shows, if, if there's a pretty prolific flowering bonsai in the show, the rest of us know that we really got our, you know, really put to the test because if we're doing a people's vote, the flowering tree will always win. Oh, this, um, the same person uh, mentioned my uncle lived in Hawaii. He had a bonsai that was made out of a geranium. Was made out of a what? Geranium. Yes. Again, you know, geraniums will as, as they continue to to grow. And, you know, a lot of people will take geraniums and instead of you know leaving them freeze, they'll bring them, put them in their basement or whatever. Or again, if you were to basically greenhouse them. Their, their bark will start, their, their outer skin will start to get almost bark-like, and again, you can have a unique flower. Another little offshoot of that is uh, there's a, a flower called a nerodium, which is actually, I believe, part of the geranium family. They're generally quite small, and uh, they make some really unique little bones eye, you know, under five, six inches, and then, you know, you get flowers continuously on them. And they're very, very interesting. I happen to have one, um, and yeah, it's they're they're very, very nice to have. Do bonsai grow well or keep well in the home? Say, I don't have a greenhouse, and I would like to start this hobby, but um, could in the winter keep it? Typically, if you are going to start the hobby and you don't have the wherewithal to uh, what we'll call overwinter. So in other words, if you're trying to grow a maple or a juniper or, or pine, they have to go dormant. You know, that is their typical season as fall comes, it gets colder, they don't get as much light. And so they, you know, the deciduous trees drop all their leaves, the conifers start to turn, you know, they lose their green and turn rusty and they wait out winter. So that's what you have to do to those. So if you don't have that opportunity and you only have your hope, then you go with tropical trees, which can be grown year round. And uh, the ficuses, the ceresas, the chefalaras, there's uh, Fukian teas. There's, there's a great number of, of Brazilian rain trees, uh, of trees that you could keep in the house. Again, like anything, you know, you, you bring those trees. If, if you can have them out in the summer, 
have them outside. They gain the strength of the summer and then generally about late September when our evenings start dropping into the below 50 at night, that's generally when you'll bring them back inside. And of course, as you bring them back inside, they're not getting as good a light. The other thing with our houses in the winter is our heating systems make it so dry in the house. So they struggle for humidity. And that's where I showed my little hoop house in the basement. Well, it's humid in there and it's 75 to 80 degrees in there. So they, they think they're down in Florida, they're happy. You know, even better than Florida, you know, because Florida will get in the 30s on them. We're not letting them do that here. <laughs> Well, great. Well, th that's all the questions that we have. And um, really appreciate the time you took today, Ron. Um, great presentation, a lot of fun. Um, your trees are amazing. Uh, it's probably turned into a full-time job, hasn't it? Well, I retired last year, so yes, now this is my <laughs> full-time job. <laughs> What a fun hobby, though, and um, and actually a business too, um, which is yeah. which is wonderful. So it, it is a nice hobby, and and the unique thing about it is, you know, you could have one tree and be fine, and then I know people that have hundreds of trees, and the reality is, you got to find a balance somewhere in between because when you have a several hundred trees and you're still working, you don't. Sadly, you don't do any of them justice because you just don't have enough time. Yeah. I mean, even with my collection of 60-ish, 70 trees, now I've got time to spend on them. And, and, and I will see it here in the next four or five years as I have more, more time and do things at the time you should be doing them, they're going to respond to that and I will get more growth and, and enhancement of them than I was before. So it's it's a it's a great hobby, and you know you can. We're, we're always trying to get younger people involved because, I mean, I've got tree. I've been in doing this now for 27 years, so I still have my original tree, which is pretty good. Just seeing how that tree has developed in 27 years, and even you know, the ugly duckling that you saw since '99 to now, so now I'm basically at 21 years. That tree has evolved into, I'm hopefully going to enter that in the national competition next year. And uh, because it's uh, the variety of tree it is, there's not a lot of people that have done linden as a, as a bonsai tree because they all see the giant leaves in a big tree and think that they can't be reduced. And, and so we're hoping that we can get in there and, and do well with that. Great. So, so finally, I just want to, there's a couple more messages that came, Ron, and it, it said, hi, Ron, my name is Ben, and along with my girlfriend, Kelsey, we are really excited to start Bonsai. We live in Milwaukee. We can't wait to meet you, and we just wanted to say thanks for the awesome presentation. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. And then also, what is your website, Ron? Uh, aabonsai.com. Great. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Thanks for coordinating this and, um, and uh, getting Rod back here for the second, first time or whatever. But we. Sure. Next, and, next... and what I'll do is, Susan, I will, uh, I will PD up the, the, uh, the presentation and I'll send you an email with that in it. That sounds really, really good. Thank you so much, Ron. It was really fascinating. And I'd like to reiterate what you said earlier about your exhibition, May 15th and 16th at Albrecht Botanical Gardens. So we'll look forward to seeing and meeting you there. All right. Great. Well, yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, folks, All for right, joining. You too. Yep.